decision. Hey everyone, Dave here, and today's episode is another of those perplexed fascination sort of obsessions. Right now, I'm preoccupied with a very short-lived television series called Gemini Man. Dave's obsession, Dave's obsession of the moment. Gemini Man was not a series that most people would call particularly good, but I find it incredibly fascinating. It's a very loose adaptation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man, centered around a secret agent who becomes invisible in a tragic accident, and can only remain visible due to a special device. Very loose adaptation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man. But, if you're anything like me, you probably first encountered this series under a different name. And on a different series. I'm sending you the worst movie I know. It's called Riding with Death and it sucks on toes. That's right, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 classic Riding with Death was edited together from two episodes of Gemini Man. And I've always loved this episode. Yeah, the riffers rely pretty heavily on the It's the 70s and Ben Murphy is Mellow comments, and they really milk the turkey gags, even though by their own admission it doesn't come up all that much in the film. All this talk of turkeys in today's movie One, led two, me two, to realize the true nature of my superpower. But I've always had a soft spot for this episode. It's got a certain charm to it, the turkey volume guessing man sketch ranks among the series' very best, and of course the filmmakers made so many choices that probably seemed like good ideas at the time. If it wasn't painfully obvious that this was two thrown-together TV episodes, the story structure would be absolutely baffling. The main character can turn invisible, but that's not what the movie's about, it's just a little side trick he has. An entirely new villain is brought in halfway through. And then there's... whatever's going on here. So what made this movie so unfocused? Well, for starters, the two episodes it cut together weren't exactly a two-parter. In fact, they come from opposite ends of the series. The only thing they have in common is comedy country singer Jim Stafford guest starring as a trucker named Buffalo Bill. And yes, they awkwardly try to tie the two episodes together with painfully obvious 80-yard lines, acting as if there's any sort of continuity between the two episodes beyond the one recurring character. If you get up around Ontario, look me up. <laughs> Will do. Sam, come back here. You're as elusive as Robert Denby. <laughs> quite a mustache while I was on vacation. And the second episode didn't have the show's female lead, Catherine Crawford as Abby, so they cut another footage of her watching the action on magical spy cam. <laughs> See, that makes so much more sense. If she had disappeared halfway through the film, I'd just be wondering where she is. Now I'm just wondering where she is. And yet, they have no trouble flashing back to the pilot episode, where Intersect boss Leonard Driscoll is played by a completely different actor and they don't even try to explain it away. In fact, the actor from the flashback gets higher building than the actor from the two primary episodes. And yet the funniest part of all this? They really didn't need to make Gemini Man weirder than it already was. In fact, there's actually one place, and one place alone, where the Riding with Death edit makes an improvement. In the original version of the second half, Buffalo Bill Rides Again, Bill and Sam flash back to the previous episode using the most terrifyingly ominous flashback transition imaginable. Yeah, they're both evil! Well, I mean, they needed these flashbacks in case the audience didn't remember nine episodes ago. Or they would if this episode had ever actually aired. But even the editors of Riding With Death knew that flashbacks to the first half of the film weren't necessary. Still, it's strange that they'd so haphazardly cobble together this made-for-TV movie when the pilot already was a TV movie. What's more, it was a TV movie that's relatively coherent, with one key storyline, and Sam's powers and limitations are actually relevant to the plot. The show was developed by Star Trek producer Harv Bennett, The Outer Limits creator Leslie Stevens, and all-around TV legend Stephen Bochco, who basically created every show that Stephen J. Cannell didn't. And it was basically created to be a lower-budget alternative to their previous Secret Agent Invisible Man series from a season earlier. This new series apparently took place in the then-future of sometime after 1983. It never really comes up. The pilot begins with almost two and a half minutes of stock footage with radio chatter explaining that Intersect and Royce Industries are going to investigate a fallen satellite, but the Russians want to stop them at all cost. As I mentioned, Driscoll is played in this episode by a different actor, Richard Dysart, who you're probably too young to remember from L.A. Law, but you've probably seen The Thing? You've almost definitely seen Back to the Future Part 3. Anyway, he's trying to find out where Sam is since he's scheduled to be part of the dive team. What is he doing in that helicopter? Sir, he's gone fishing. Fishing? And we're introduced to our hero, fishing for sharks from a helicopter. 
I can't tell if this is supposed to establish him as reckless or thoughtful. It's painted as a waste of time and resources and a clear case of playing by his own rules. But he's doing it to make sure the dive area is safe. Can't let divers risk their lives in shark infested waters, Leonard. And what's more, the usually responsible Dr. Abby Lawrence is cheering him on. She seems to be his biggest fan, but they have a flirtation where she rebuffs every one of his advances. I'll return the favor sometime. <laughs> you will. I'm sure they were trying to set up a will they or won't they here, and instead they set up a where the hell is she. Anyway, he doesn't catch the shark, so this scene introduces a hero, the apparent secret agent helicopter pilot diver with a personality we can't quite grasp, failing at an assignment he's set for himself, and you might think this is setting up a threat for later, and yes, during the dive they occasionally cut to the shark, but the shark doesn't affect anything that actually happens. Yeah, setting things up that don't pay off will be a running theme on this show. Anyway, they go to the briefing. This is Mr. Driscoll, Director of International Security Technics. He'll give you the intelligence background. The Navy tracking vessel identified this hardware as a Russian weather satellite. However, fleet intelligence says it's a lot hotter than that. They seem to think it's some kind of a new secret weapon, an atomic-powered laser. Mr. Royce. Thank you, Leonard. For your whopping three-and-a-half-sentence speech. But one of Royce's men, played by MacGyver's boss, is secretly working for the Russians, so he sends his sidekick to destroy the satellite. And Sam gets caught in an underwater explosion. Nothing to do with the shark. Leonard and Abby scramble to see if he's still alive, they take off his mask, and if 1970s taped off a of TV video quality had held up better, we'd see that the suit is empty! That's right, Sam has been turned invisible by the explosion. The invisibility. It, it seems to spread outward from his body. So that explains why his clothes turn invisible, but not why his bandages or bed sheets or other objects he holds remain visible. We use bandages from the first aid packet. Oh right, those invisible proof bandages. It turns out the explosion destabilized Sam's DNA molecular structure, and that's why he's invisible. Yeah, dude, that sounds sciencey enough to be true. Nobody but Abby and Driscoll know Sam's invisible, but everyone at Intersect is working around the clock on a cure for invisibility. I guess they all assume it's just busy work. But they manage to build a stabilizer into a digital watch, which our planet still thinks is a pretty neat idea. What if it runs down? It can't. It's powered by plutonium and cobalt chips. Uh, plutonium. Wait a minute. Are you, are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? That's right. And Abby has a matching watch to monitor him, because these two are just committing to having their lives revolve around each other non-romantically. Seriously, Abby is said to be a brilliant scientist. I assume she invented this watch, or at least played a major part in its invention. She's basically responsible for mankind's greatest achievement, and her primary duty at Intersect appears to be Sam's babysitter. But remember, it's got to stay in contact with your skin. Because if anything goes wrong, you've got to connect back with the mothership, or you fade out for good. Abby, will you quit talking and get this thing off of me? Stop your mouth words of concern for my life and leave my fate to the atomic battery. Sam can turn off the stabilizer and become invisible, but only for up to 50 15 minutes a day. Any longer than that, and he stays invisible forever. 15 minutes, Abby, why didn't you tell me that? You didn't give me a chance. No, you had plenty of chance to tell him. Can I flick around and off? Like a road blinker. There. There's where you warn him. Yeah, you can flick it on and off, but not for more than a total of 15 minutes per day. And of course, they never explain why. They never explain whether the problem is with the stabilizer itself or with his DNA. They never explain why the 15 minute limit resets every day. They never explain how they pinpointed it at 15 minutes. And I'm not saying we necessarily need all this explained, but they spend a lot of time reciting techno babble, explaining things in just enough mindless detail to bore us into assuming there's actual science going on here. But when something that's actually potentially relevant comes up, we're just supposed to accept it without caveat. They spend plenty of time setting things up that don't pay off later, but don't explain the cause and effect of things that are supposed to pay off. I don't understand. We are not alone there. And I get it, the real reason there's the 15 minute time limit is to ensure the invisibility isn't a limitless superpower. It's like the One Ring, invisibility causes as many problems as it solves. The ticking clock provides extra stakes. Except, as far as I've seen, those stakes only ever really come up later on at the end of the pilot. In all the other episodes I've seen, Sam's just flicking on and off willy-nilly with little concern for his time limit, and the invisibility actually is treated as a limitless superpower. Oh, the opening credit sequence drives the stakes home, but the show itself comfortably ignores them. 
Even in the pilot, he spends his very valuable invisibility time trolling police officers. But he's sure to become visible long enough to harass secretaries. He's flicking on and off. Well, I've got better things to do than sit here and listen to him beep. But what if Sam's in danger or it's malfunctioning? I've got better things to do. Okay, I lied. I don't have anything better to do. You're sure it's receiving correctly at this distance? <sighs> Leonard, that unit could transmit from the moon. It's atomic powered, remember? <laughs> well, screw 4G. I'm getting a phone with an atomic network plan. It's too late. His time's run out. We've got to get to him. Let's go. And then at the end of the pilot, when his time does run out, he... turns out okay. So the stakes really meant nothing. Now that makes sense. And most of his assignments don't really take advantage of his superpower, at least not intentionally. He's just sent on run-of-the-mill secret agent stuff. He's not being hired to be an invisible truck driver, just a truck driver. He's not hired to be an invisible cop roaming Courthouse Square ten years before it became Hill Valley, just a cop. He uses his invisibility as a mildly convenient tool to help him with most of his missions. More often than not, Sam's invisibility is used in physical altercations the way punching is used. Yeah, the driver doesn't even notice the sound of someone climbing up on the roof, and he's only slightly phased by the door opening on its own. On the other hand, he doesn't really seem to have espionage skills other than the invisibility, so... What was he doing for the agency before the accident? Other than shark fishing from helicopters, I mean. He's also constantly throwing himself on his own into situations he's unprepared for, sneaking into enemy territory completely unarmed with no real plan other than lurking around until he learns something. And he never gives a fake name. He uses his real name with every fake identity he assumes. Glad to meet you, Tina. Sam Casey. Glad to meet you, Nick. Sam Casey. You can call me Sam. He's a secret agent whose only secret is his invisibility, and yet his assignments don't revolve around his invisibility. He's an intersect agent. Certain. Of course I am. How can something so cliche-ridden be so unusual? I want to say this is the kind of stuff Police Squad was parodying a decade later, but no, this is the kind of stuff Get Smart and Batman were parodying a decade earlier. And of course they do one of my favorite television cliches, the look-alike episode, allowing one actor to play multiple roles. Some shows do this with a relative, but this show does the variation where it's an enemy disguising himself as Sam, trying to sneak into Intersect. But Sam finds out about it and goes to assume the enemy's identity at their headquarters. And then the enemy escapes and goes after Sam. And that leads to wacky mix-ups where everyone else thinks they're the person they're not, and they just react with confusion. Didn't she just give you a piece? Oh. Honest did. Well, how could you give me a piece? Doesn't the assassin know Sam was heading there? Why is he confused? Did you find her? Did I find who? Honest did. Of course I found her. You were right there in the room. Don't you remember, love? Okay, Sam definitely knows the assassin's back, so he shouldn't be confused. This episode has the attention span of a goldfish on Fun Dip. Still, the show was capable of occasional signs of intelligence. There's one episode with an evil, destructive robot called Minotaur. We're never told why it's called Minotaur, it doesn't look like a Minotaur. We don't know if Minotaur stands for anything. It seems like just a randomly assigned name. But then it spends most of the episode chasing Sam around a labyrinth. And they don't draw attention to that fact. Sam never once says, Ugh, I feel like Icarus in here. Sure, the name still doesn't make sense in-universe, but it's a nice, clever, subtle allusion to mythology. And while a lot of the villain's plans tend to be expectedly stupid, some of them actually are thinking through their plans, like in the aforementioned Lookalike episode. While the Lookalike is infiltrating Intersect, the villains try to kill Sam by drugging him, bringing him to a cave, and blowing it up. Okay, we're wondering why they don't just poison him, but at least they do check to make sure he's dead after the explosion. Yeah, these aren't those stupid villains who just assume the hero will die easily enough, they'd make sure he actually would be dead. And the only reason their plan fails is because they didn't know he could turn invisible. But of course, those occasional clever touches are buried under several scoops of nonsense and a healthy topping of cheese. That said, Crow should feel vindicated to discover that turkeys do indeed get several more mentions throughout the series. I saw a couple of turkeys right behind you, turkey. Hey, turkey. Gemini Man is a series that constantly has me asking why. Oh, it's far from the most insane television series of all time. Hell, it's far from the most insane television series I've talked about on this show. But it raises far more questions than it answers, even despite its heavy overload of irrelevant exposition. 
There are just enough bursts of genuine cleverness to make me wonder how self-aware the writing team was about the rest of the show's silliness, and how much of the show's shortcomings were the result of outside limitations. But either way, I find the shortcomings entertaining and fun to dissect, and the show occasionally even entertains me on a non-ironic level. None of these scripts or performances are winning Emmys, but the cast does have a certain chemistry, and I'll just admit it. I don't care what anyone says, there's something about Ben Murphy's easygoing smugness that I find just plain fun. Hell, I don't care how annoying Buffalo Bill is, it's downright charming that Sam's genuinely happy to be reunited with the idiot. Well, Buffalo matters to me, Leonard. If there's one thing to be learned from this baffling television curiosity, it's that even the best of intentions can get muddled along the way, creating a result that doesn't live up to the source material, but is still unique and fascinating. That's how my own adaptation of War of the Worlds got rewritten into an animated musical about a starship piloted by chinchillas. You can probably sell it to Blue Sky. I don't know if I recommend this to every self-proclaimed, so-bad-it's-good fan. Most of them have seen far weirder shows and movies, so they might just find this mediocre and boring. But if, like me, you're fascinated by inconsistent levels of effort leading to even more inconsistent results smothered in a healthy dose of 70s cheese, you should check this out. Sadly, as of this recording, Gemini Man is not legally available on DVD, at least not in the US, and neither is the MST3K episode Riding With Death. But both are available on YouTube in less than legal capacity. You'll probably enjoy the MC2K episode more than the series, but check them out if you feel like it. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.